everybody, I'm Steve Brown and welcome to our Utah Jazz Special, Where Are They Now? During the next half hour, we'll visit with four former Utah Jazz men and find out where life after basketball has taken them. We start here in Silver Spring, Maryland with a man who played basketball just a few miles down the street at DeMatha High School in Washington, D.C. His basketball career took him to the Hall of Fame, but his post-basketball career just might surprise you. Behind the head socks stands a Hall of Fame basketball player, a guy who was NBA Rookie of the Year, six-time All-Star, twice led the NBA in scoring, and averaged more than 24 points a game over 15 seasons. Go, go. You'll find Adrian Dantley working as a school crossing guard for the Montgomery County School District. Up, Not of necessity, Dantley is famously frugal, but by choice. A couple of guys came by me one time and said, huh, I, bet you you, I bet you thought you'd never be in this position. Then I had another guy's like, is this, hey, is it, it got to this, you know? Then I had another guy on the bus, he took a picture of me. See, and uh, a buddy of mine called me and said, this is what happened when you mess up in the NBA. <laughs> Dantley doesn't have money issues post-NBA career but he does have a group of friends who think he might have too much time on his hands. We are in the weight room one day and all these guys was in there talking and they were saying, you know, we gotta find Adrian a job, we gotta get him a job. So they were saying all these things, what I need to do, and I was just listening. So I said, I know what's a good job for you. All of my buddies, they got private business and they don't have insurance. So all their wives are crossing guards. Come on. And if you're a crossing guard, you get free insurance. So when you when you retire, you're on your own. You know, and me being money conscious the way I am, you know, I'm paying seventeen thousand dollars for Blue Cross Blue Shield for a family of five. I said, I think I might do this. I think I might like this. So uh, I've worked this before. This is a pretty busy intersection. Danley says he'll continue to do this job for life, but it's a job not without its moments. I've been hit by a vehicle maybe twice and definitely saved two kids from getting hit. It's amazing how many people who drive have their smartphone on their phone coming across the intersection. It's amazing. Dantley spent seven seasons with the fledgling Utah Jazz. Although his tenure here ended abruptly over a dispute with management, it's now remembered as perhaps the best part of his career. Well, I think that's where I blossom as a player. Every player wants to go to a team where they can sort of carry the team, or you want to go to a team where you win. That time when I was at Utah, it was a situation where we were a new franchise and uh, Coach Nasalki, you know, I was his guy, as you would say, every coach has a guy, every coach has a player, a coach that he likes. And uh, everything was just surrounded around me. And uh, each year we got better. You know, I loved it in Utah. That's why I really developed as a player. Got a lot of confidence in myself as a player. Always had confidence, but I knew that I had to play real well for us to win 30 or 35 games back then. I mean, Utah, I thought I was going to be my career there, you know, because I, I even purchased a house there because I normally don't do that. I was afraid of even buying a house when I got, you know, <laughs> started playing for teams. But uh, things didn't work out, but I had a happy, uh, you know, had a happy seven years there. Dantley wound up his NBA involvement as head coach of the Denver Nuggets, following George Carl's bout with cancer but he hasn't completely left the game. You'll still find him in a uniform these days, one with stripes. It's, it's fun, it's fun. It keeps me in shape. I do it just to keep myself in shape. And uh, I get psyched up the same way I do when I play a basketball game. It's amazing. I get up, my drilling and gets to going. I get there early, try to stretch and be ready. And, 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 when, I, and when I'm there, I say, all right, got to get a perfect game. Never got a perfect game since I've been refereeing. I get kind of benefit out of the dollar. I go to the high school game. They know who I am. It's kind of unfair because they never question me, even though I might make a bad call because they think because I played, I can't make a bad call. But I can say maybe two coaches probably question me out of over 150 games right now so far. So I get the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> I refereed a game last week, and this coach was getting on me because coaches usually don't say anything to me. He said, how could you make that call? How could you make that call? So I didn't pay any attention to him. My partner was saying, hey, don't let the referee 
talk to you like that. I said, I'm not worried about it. I got thick skin. I, I, I know I've been on both sides, so I'm not going to give him a technical. He gave him a technical. So uh, after the game, he didn't know who I was. His wife told him who I was. He came up to me and said, hey, hey, I'm sorry. If I knew who you were, I wouldn't have never gave you a hard time during the game. I said, don't worry about it, man. I got thick skin. You, you saw a call. You thought it was your way. I thought it wasn't that way. No problem. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> it might bother some athletes leaving the limelight and having a recreation basketball coach not knowing a Hall of Famer when he's right in front of him. But A.D. has always traveled to the beat of his own drum. You know, I've been around a lot of athletes, and you hear about athletes uh, wanting attention when they finish playing. That never really fazed me. You know, I felt good about myself, felt, felt comfortable with myself, knowing that I wouldn't be able to play basketball. And matter of fact, I was with someone the other day, and I said, boy, I'm glad I'm not seven foot two, because, you know, I can just blend in right with the crowd, you know, being a re retired basketball player. When we come back, when I first got into it, it was like I had to have, you know, get this in, and I had to get this in, I had to get this in, I was always worried about this stuff. Now I don't. Life in front of the camera. They've got some guys that should be playing consistently every single night, and they aren't, they're just up and down. Analytics people say, you know, the threes are way better than, than the other ones, but take the open shot. You know, like so many former professional athletes, Tom Chambers has found a home in the media. The two Toms, Chambers and Leander, offer their insight 82 nights a year to Phoenix Suns fans. When I first got into it, it was like I had to have, you know, get this in, and I had to get this in, I had to get this in, I was always worried about this stuff. Now I don't. I just, I just study it. I know everybody in the league is on my fantasy team, and you can ask me any question you want about anybody, and I pretty much have an answer for it. I'm not shy or bashful about saying it, and I will push the envelope a little bit more than a lot of other people. <laughs> I mean, the ball was really moving, and the Jazz just didn't come out. I mean, they couldn't come out and guard well enough, and they didn't look very good anyway. For Chambers, the transition took a bit of getting used to. He says it's similar to being a rookie in the NBA. You're so worried about the little things, you sometimes just forget to let it happen and rely on your instincts. It's a great comparison, it really is, because when you first get in, you try to do things, you know, all of this way. And then when you stop thinking and you just run with it because you know what, and you know what to do, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's better. And for me, especially in a studio environment, I may get five seconds here or 12 seconds here or, or, or 90 seconds. So you really can't script any of it. You just kind of have to answer and, and continue to talk about whatever they ask you. So I work out well with that. After a standout career at the University of Utah, Chambers picked eighth overall by San Diego in the 1981 draft, returned to Utah for two seasons with the Jazz from 93 to 95. No, I really wanted to go there and play. Got laid and, you know, stepped up and, and, and you know, brought me back for a couple of years and, and, you know, got to play with John and Carl and, you know, got to play in front of the family, you know. Uh, I, you know my family's there and, and, and seeing that and doing that. Now, there were really good things and there were things that weren't so good. You know, tickets always and, you know, and, and you know, all of the stuff you're doing up there. So, but uh, I love playing in Utah and had a great time. It was a great group of people. That's good. Tom Chambers with 19. The move wasn't without some adjustments, though. Well, it was it was it was it was hard for me. There was times where I went in the game, and you know, at, at 36 or whatever I was at the time, I had to get warmed up for a minute. And 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 you know, Jerry didn't really believe in you know that that stuff. It's like you're ready to go. So it was it was different. It didn't really cater to me in my prime. But at that point in my career, I wasn't the runner that I was before anyway. So it, it fit. I just needed to become a more consistent guy because I was a guy who would miss six or seven and then make seven or eight. And I didn't have that luxury, you know coming in for Jerry, it was like, dude, that's enough, okay? We're going to put somebody else in here. So that was tough at times, but uh, overall, it was a great experience. Chambers had played for Paul Silas in San Diego and Cotton Fitzsimmons in Phoenix, and he'd been the go-to guy. So stepping into the Utah Jazz circa 1993 was a bit of a culture shock. Jazz running out of time. Chambers right to left the paint, shovels it up and left hand. What a running shot. Tom Chambers. 
That was hard for me to go in there and get, get you know be a bit player, if you will. I think I got 12 or 13 points a game my first year up there. But I loved the atmosphere. I loved the guys. You know, Jeff obviously came back. You know, John, Carl. Ty, I mean, I, it was guys. It was like the sun's up there for me. It was just a really good band and group of guys that, that expected to win, and and we did. It was way more structured with Jerry than Cotton and Paul. I loved every bit of it. It was a different style of play for me, but uh, it was really nice to go home. It was really nice to play with, you know, with John and Carl and, 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 and the guys. Come on. Go, man. Come on. Come here. Good boy. Utah still plays a big role in Tom's life. Utah's mountains call him every summer. His cabin east of Salt Lake City has been a place of refuge for years. That is that is my decompression. My tractor and, and going up in the mountain and getting on my horse and, and, and just love the out of doors. Just love the out of doors. And you know, I'll get out and I ride a horse. I like working in the yard. I like doing different things out there. So the out of doors is my thing. And, and, and here it's too hot in the summer for out of doors. So going back to Utah is perfect. Thank you guys. Right over here number one. Today. Life is good for Tom Chambers. He says he has a firm handle on the important things in life. Sure, like all athletes, he's thought about staying closer to the game by coaching. Well, I, you know, when I first ended my career, I was helping a lot, you know, on the court with different players. I don't do that as much now. I mean, if they ask me to consult, and sometimes I just can't stand myself, I have to go help a big guy on something they're doing that's so simple. But um, I, I, I like coaching. I think it'd be fun for me. The problem is, is I like my life, and, and they really don't have one. I mean, it's a tremendous thing for them to do what they're doing, at, and it's probably the closest thing to playing as far as the competition goes. So that aspect of it, I would love. Love, but I like you know having having family time in the summer and horse time in the summer and you know if, why are you asking me if it's a selfie that means you're doing it yourself right and he has all that and more well then just do it you don't have to have get her done at 55 Tom Chambers grandfather of seven is where he wants to be until next summer when he'll be back riding and hunting the Utah mountains After the break, you had to chip off a little bit of the plaster and everything until you got down to see the original colors. Once we found the original colors, we then had to go and try to duplicate those because they're minerals. This isn't paint, this is minerals. That's what they use in the time. So that's what we had to use in order to put this back up. San Antonio's Mission Concepcion has stood since 1716, two years before the Alamo was built. Today, its interior has been fully restored by a former jazz man. What did you have to do to clear this place? Well, first thing you have to do is you have to take everything out in order to get down to the nitty gritty, down to the floor, down to the very smallest piece, finding the original colors, all those type of things. So you have to eventually take everything, everything you see in here had to come out. It's a historical site, so you have to make sure that you put a number on everything. If you're pulling out the grout, you want to make sure that you take that grout, put it off in an envelope, and number it. That way, if anyone ever wanted to know, okay, where it came from, or if you had, say, you wanted to put it in a museum, you're able to say, this is the original, this is where it came from, and I have it. Antoine Carr patrolled the lane for the Utah Jazz from 1994 through 98. The big dog was known for his physical play and larger-than-life personality. Nothing about Carr could have been considered subtle. But life after basketball has dropped him squarely in a profession where less is more. Carr's company won the bid to restore Mission Concepcion, and in this setting, subtlety is a must. When you're used to painting with latex and those things, it's completely different. It's a minerals. You're using grass. You're using different things that are natural. And you're having to make them stay on a wall that happens to be limestone. And if you ever tried to put paint on limestone, you know it tends to turn black. So you had to turn and learn different techniques. And one of the techniques that they used to use in the old days was they used to wash the walls with milk. So you'll see some of the areas that are cut out all over the place. Those are areas that we wanted to show and expose the history and see what we've done since then 
the new colors, the exact same colors that they used back then, the exact same minerals. He has to crouch and make that strong dribble and go to the middle. Training 17-year-old son AJ is also a big part of Antoine's day. The six foot seven high school senior is hoping for a Division I scholarship under his dad's watchful eye. It makes it a little bit tougher. Um, you're trying to get him to understand that the way you train, the way you did things may suit him and may not. So you have to take that into consideration. Uh, my style of play, thank God, is a lot more similar to his, so I'm able to partake in teaching them things that are a little bit easier. It's a busy life for Carr. He's hoping to land the restoration contract on two more of the city's missions. And there's a political satire radio show in the works. But through it all, one thing hasn't changed. Big Dog's signature sign-off. <laughs> Up next, just skating by. Both of my teams get under people's skin pretty bad, but nobody ever hits me. <laughs> <laughs> For our final feature in Where Are They Now, we track down former jazz big man Greg Ostertag. What he's up to these days may surprise you. You see, this is where Greg Ostertag showcases his newfound athletic skill set, the Ice Den in Scottsdale, Arizona. Yep, that's Tag all right. All seven foot two inches of him when he's on ice skates, thundering down the left wing for the Thursday Night Beer League's full rhino team. When I was young, my dad is from Wisconsin, and uh, he, he got me into it, I'm guessing, uh, when I was six or seven years old or something like that, and I played for a year. When I retired, uh, I played golf every day for a year and loved it uh, and I had met a, but, met a guy out here who, uh, whose son played and, he, and I said let's go skate and started skating one day and just I looked like a baby giraffe uh, it, but it doesn't take long you know once you start to get the back feet back on you know, when I got to where I was, felt comfortable on them I joined the league and uh, you know I'm not great but I can skate I can stop I can shoot I can I understand the game I love it I love it if I could play five days a week I'd play it even though it's, they call it beer league, it, it, tempers can get a little high out there and, and, and my, both of my teams get under people's skin pretty bad, but nobody ever hits me. They just <laughs> I don't know if they're, if they're afraid of the repercussions of me accidentally on purpose running into them, or, but it's funny because you know, when there's fights or you know, there's discussions on the ice, I get in the middle of it and get everybody apart with the referees and stuff like this. And, uh, you know, I've got a pretty a reputation. I just, I just go out and play, and I don't, you know, get under anybody's. I let everybody, could I laugh? It's, it's comedy a lot of the time, just watching how irritated these guys get. During his NBA career, Greg often had to retrieve his teeth, the result of errant elbows. Something seemingly more suited to his new sport. But... I got, they don't come out anymore. I got, them, I got them fixed, so they stay in now. Uh, I figure I'm not going to play basketball anymore. I don't have to worry about... Uh, Curtis Borchardt hit me in the mouth like he did the first game we played Utah when I was in Sacramento. Oh, he smashed me. And he broke my, he broke him. He broke my teeth that day. As a jazz man, Tag was often an enigma. So much potential, often unrealized. It's not lost on him. I took for granted seven foot two. And you know, I've been this tall since I was sophomore in high school. Uh, I didn't have to work at it. And you could see it more in college, you know, I started to kind of not, not fall back, but I kind of leveled off. Because I, again, I took it for granted. I'm seven foot two, you know, I can do this. Knowing what I know now, I'd have worked harder and I'd have been a lot better player. And then there was the relationship with Jerry Sloan. I looked at our relationship kind of like a father-son. You know, he was there to pat me on the back when I did something okay, and there to just tell me how bad I was doing it when I wasn't. Or when something was going wrong, I knew that it was coming my way. Now I'm older and stuff, and I start, I can really kind of realize what he was saying. I, you know, I should have listened. <laughs> like most of us, Tag has regrets. That's my biggest regret, more than anything, is quitting. And, and I'll probably say not 
being the player that that everybody, Jerry, knew I could be, and fighting, fighting with Jerry all the time. There's at least one thing Greg learned from his longtime coach, though. You can't play backwards. I'm as happy as I've been in a long time. Um, again, I do have regrets with basketball, with life, some things I've, you know, mistakes I've made, uh, but I've always tried to live under the, 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 the credo or motto, whatever you want to say, if, if you can't do anything about the past. And, and you know, I've learned that from basketball. Uh, you know, basketball is such a, you know, up and down thing. It's, it's, you can't worry about the play that just happened because there's something else happened somewhere else. Uh, and I try to move forward with it. I've got my kids, my son's 21. I've got an 18 year old about to graduate. Uh, I've got my 16 year old over here. And they are uh, everything to me. So that's what I try to do. I try to, I try to amend the mistakes I made and push them in the right direction and go from there. So I, uh, just enjoy being a, a father and a, and a husband and having a new baby and, and I'm moving to Texas in June and on a farm, a little 90 acre farm and kind of the stuff I've always wanted to do. So that's why I'm going. Janice fans, you're still my favorite. I love you guys. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. We hope you've enjoyed our look back at four former Utah Jazz men from four different eras who have at least one thing in common a fond memory of jazz fans, whether they played in a building called the Salt Palace, the Delta Center, or Energy Solutions Arena. Until next time, good night, everybody. It's truly amazing that the stuff that these guys have now. They they get their highlights from the first half and and, and look at them at halftime yep. and then come back out and make adjustments off of that. So the uh, the league's changing in a lot of ways. University of Utah, Wichita State, all the top Division One schools better come get this beast before I unleash them on somebody. <laughs>